At the time, I had a girlfriend who um, a few days uh, later, Billy Graham was speaking for the whole week in Vancouver. She had gone to hear him and she had invited me to a, an event that was on a Friday night. It was a youth event. I remember being at the event and really kind of mocking it. Um, you know, I'd hear the people singing and it's like, oh, they're lip syncing, it's fake. And I remember when uh, Billy Graham got up to speak and when he starts speaking, something starts firing off in me. Something is awakened. Something is stirred inside of me that I, I don't have words to really describe it. He had made the invitation that, you know, this Jesus is here for you. His arms are open. Come, I invite you to come now. Come now to this stadium floor. Eventually, I, I stood up and I turned to the people that are all beside me and I said to them, well, if none of you are going, then I'm going to get out of my way. Well, Ken, it's an honor to be recording your testimony today. For the people who may not know who you are, who maybe have never seen you, could you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Ken Silk. I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I have a set of twins, a boy and a girl that are 24, and I am married and uh, happily married in Winnipeg. Amen. Uh, Ken, how long are, yeah, how long have you been faithfully walking with Jesus now? Uh, I have been walking with Jesus for 39 years. Whoa. Well, tell us, if you could just tell us about your life before Jesus, starting with your childhood. Did you grow up in a Christian home? Did you know of who Jesus was as, uh, as a kid? Yeah, so my childhood memories are... Uh, filled with a lot of great things and some sad things and a lot of questions. Uh, my dad was from England and my mom was from the Ukraine. Uh, they both met in Canada. My mom was actually born in Canada. And my mom had had uh, three miscarriages before I was born, so I didn't know this at the time, but I was never supposed to be born. In my earliest recollection, I remember being a lot of my childhood being in out of the hospital for a variety of things. Uh, hearing, uh, had tubes in my ears for hearing, so I had a, developed a lisp. I also did not know at the time I had celiac disease, so I was always had a bloated stomach and a lot of what seemed like to be anemia issues. Um, a lot of my memories of things that we would do, we were a close family, we would do lots of things, like go camping, uh, exploring, uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we had also had dogs, which is a lot of fun. I have an older sister, and older sisters like to tell younger brothers what to do all the time, which is great. Um, so for me, a lot of my childhood memories are really around a lot of good family times and doing different things. We moved a lot within Canada. My dad's profession at the time had us moving, so every two, three years we'd be moving to a new uh, city, which as, a, as a, ch a kid looking back at it, I can see, you know, there was a lot of hardship in making friends. You would just get to make friends and definitely being younger, never understood why we'd be moving. We did go uh, to church when I was younger. And so I would remember going to Sunday schools and different churches, but at some point, we quit going and then it would just be my sister and I would get picked up by my parents had friends that were going to church and we'd get picked up and eventually we stopped going to church altogether because we moved yet one more time and that was the end of moving. From a uh, spiritual perspective, you know, I had some experience at church. I can't say it was anything in depth. I just really remember, you know, Sunday school, uh, you know, some teaching and some flannel graph uh, teaching in the Bible. And I remember my grandparents in England sending me a Bible that I thought was really cool because it had pictures in it. So I really liked the pictures and I look at the Bible a lot just because the pictures were kind of uh, cool looking through the Bible. but never really understood the Bible or understood the words. It was uh, very hard to get a grasp uh, of that type of a story for me as a child. Can tell us about your life growing up, right? So not understanding the Bible, moving a lot. How did that affect as uh, your life as you begin to grow up? So growing up, the challenge of moving a lot uh, meant that uh, friendships would come and friendships would go, and it would create a lot of discouragement or disillusionment and finding ways to relieve stress or 
anxiety. Uh, I did turn to sports. Uh, I played a lot of sports and, and my dad really encouraged me in some of the sports, uh, soccer being one of them. My dad coached me. So that was a, a great outlet. But there was a constant looking or striving to try and find something. And, and just as you would start to find your place, you'd get in clubs or get in sports, then we'd move again. And I think there was a little bit of un lack of understanding and resentment and even sadness because, you know, this was the day when there was no text messaging or emails and you, your friendships just fell off. You weren't phoning friends. And so you had friends that, you know, you would call each other best friends and then you just moved and you wouldn't see them again or you wouldn't hear from them again. So I, I think it created at sometimes some bitterness or lack of understanding or why do we have to move again? And really that in itself started some, probably some destructive behavior in myself, trying to find meaning, my own meaning, trying to find my way. I would have thought that I was a good person. I would have thought that, you know, I was uh, standing up for what was good and, and didn't like evil and felt that good was the right thing to do. The thing that I remember from my childhood, the only thing that I remember, and it's not uh, meant about my father in a, in a bad light, would, was him telling me when I would pray, and I remember this, uh, this is the only thing I remember from my dad telling me from a spiritual perspective, just tell God how you feel because he can take it. So, you know, I remember lots of times I, I wouldn't even consider it prayer uh, as much as more of a venting. I just tell God how mad at him I was that we're moving again and, you know, why would it allow it to happen? which is not necessarily healthy, but it was uh, what I was trying to do to get rid of the anxiety or the stress about yet moving and losing all my friendships. Even uh, when I got into my early teens uh, and we were still moving around a lot, I started finding that girls would be sympathetic to my story. Oh, you know, poor woe was me, we've moved a lot. And they would feel bad for me. It would be like I was their, their sympathy person that they would want to come to, or I mean, I could go to, and they wanted to hear my story and make me feel better. And I realized that uh, very quickly that uh, I could play on that. And that gave me the, uh, it's not a, necessarily a good opportunity, but I started having a lot of girlfriends. Sometimes I'd have two girlfriends at once. And it wasn't, they weren't romantic relationships, but they were just feeling wanted and feeling that someone cared about you. It wasn't that I didn't feel my parents loved me. My mom uh, was very protective uh, over me because of growing up with having celiac disease that was undiagnosed, uh, having a lot of health related issues. Uh, my dad was traveling a lot with the nature of his job. So it just seemed to be a natural thing where I could feel some worth. Uh, from these girls that were more than willing to, I don't want to say throw themselves at me, but wanted to really hear me and, you know, be there for me. So it was something that I definitely took advantage of. The other side, well, then I threw myself into sports. Uh, it didn't matter what the sport was at uh, school, at different levels of school, junior high or high school. I excelled in track and all the teams. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the sports were, but I excelled really well at them. Academically, you know, I think I was trying to, to prove to my parents and trying to earn a little bit of my dad's love by trying to do things well in sports and trying to do things well academically and waiting for that praise that good job, well done. And when I didn't hear it, I just would be frustrated and I'd try to find the outlet uh, that would provide that sort of gratification or, or satisfaction. I can't say that I uh, never grew up in a house that had a lot of uh, language being spoken or alcohol, but I did in my older teens uh, start finding through school and through sports, uh, the parties that would be had for rugby or soccer or whatever the sport was, it'd be these big parties and lots of beer. And, and so that seemed to be another new avenue of life. You want to have fun, this is what you do to have fun. So uh, it would be entertaining or be doing uh, different types of parties. Never did any sort of drugs. Uh, drugs were always something that for me was just always I recognized as not being something that would, it was actually a little bit scary. I scared of drugs, so it, it was mm. nothing that I ever tried. So I was really mindful of that. Mm. Ken, when, in those moments when you were venting to God, did that continue in your teen, teenage years or did you begin to push him away? What was your relationship with God in that time? 
Yeah, I don't think that I actually ever really felt close to God. I just feel that it was just something that I can do. I'd be go in my bed and just say, God, here's how I feel. And then you'll walk away. And it was like, I don't want to say God was an imaginary friend, but it was almost like it was an imaginary person that I'd be speaking to. Even though I had lots of uh, dreams, I remember some incredible vivid dreams that, um, you know, I can still recall today that may have been God speaking to me. Uh, they were still just so abstract and so weird and so hard to accept based on what I was experiencing in my own life, which was really not the level of, uh, of love or acceptance that I thought I would necessarily continually be receiving from my parents. Mm. Although loving, doing an act of kindness is not the same as just telling you that you love, that somebody loves you. So I found that Although I would say, you know, if the devil showed up, I would fight him because I felt that, you know, I was good, I was morally good, and he was bad, and, you know, that's what God would do. Uh, you know, God fought for the good person. So that's kind of my understanding of what was, my, from a spiritual perspective, that I was good. Yeah. Now, Ken, you had a, a, a I believe in your teenage years, uh, I could be wrong, but I, I believe in your teenage years is when you encountered God. Can you tell us about that? Can you just tell us, take us through that moment when it became real to you, when when God showed up in your life? Yeah, so I clearly remember always kind of thinking that the Christian people or church people were weirdos, and I wasn't really uh, gravitating to them. And there was going to be an event happening. I lived in Vancouver at the time. And uh, I remember watching on the news with my mom, asking my mom about this person that was seemed to be so captivated in the news. And his name was Billy Graham. And I didn't quite understand. I didn't know who Billy Graham was, what he was doing, but he was on all the news channels. He was in all the media. So it was like some celebrities in town. Uh, and I didn't really know. And my mom gave me a bit of an answer. And it's, it wasn't a, a bad answer. Just she said, he's a good guy, you know, a good man that uh, talks about God and and I didn't think much of it. I just thought, okay, I don't know what that is, but there was something intriguing by it. At the time, I had a girlfriend who um, a few days uh, later, Billy Graham was speaking for the whole week in Vancouver. She had gone to hear him, and she had invited me to a, an event that was on a Friday night. It was a youth event. It was called uh, Sex and the Panic Button. I still remember the topic very clearly, not because, uh, you know, I may have been promiscuous in my earlier days, but it wasn't an overriding or overarching thing for me. So going, I went with a, a youth group from a church. Uh, it was uh, a church that I wasn't going to, but my girlfriend had known someone from it. So we went with kind of like a young adults. I was 19 at the time and, and we were going to the event that night. So we went by bus and we arrived and we were at BC Place, which is in Vancouver. It seats around 60,000 plus people. Wow. And when we got there, for whatever reason, we were in the second last row in the stadium and you couldn't get, there's only one row behind us and I was sitting all the way on the inside. So there was about 15 people to the right of me uh, for this event. And I remember being at the event and really kind of mocking it. Um, you know, I'd hear the people singing and it's like, oh, they're lip syncing, it's fake. You know, not really thinking much of the event and looking around and just looking at the people and, and not really thinking a lot. I thought that, you know, again, the people that were outside saying Jesus saves, I was just thinking they were a bunch of weirdos. You know, if I beat them up, I'd probably be doing a good thing for God. It's like, that can't be real. So for me, the, uh, the issue of being inside now, this event was just kind of surreal. And I remember when uh, Billy Graham got up to speak, you know, I really kind of took a, a looking at him. I saw him on TV. Now here I am seeing the person live. I'm seeing him real. He's right, not right in front of me because I'm quite far in the stands, but I'm seeing him for live. And when he starts speaking, something starts firing off in me. Something is awakened. Something is stirred inside of me that I, I don't have words to really describe it. As he continued to speak, I remember feeling uncomfortable and trying to move around in my seat. It felt like he was talking just to me. It didn't matter what everybody else was there. He had a message that he was talking to me. And it wasn't that he had said anything necessarily profound. And I remember when he had finished his talk, he had then made an invitation. 
He had made the invitation that, you know, this, if you, Jesus is here for you. His arms are open. Come, I invite you to come now. Come now to this stadium floor and we will meet with you. And, and I'm thinking, I can't go. My friends are going to leave me. And no sooner than I say that, he goes, come. You're, and you don't worry, your friends won't leave you. And I'm thinking, oh, darn it. All right, well, the bus is going to leave. We came by a bus. And then he says, and don't worry, the bus is not going to leave. And I'm still inside, like just, just busting, but I'm, I'm wrestling with my mind and, and this pull inside of me that I can't even articulate or understand what it is. That I, I, I just got to go down there. Eventually, I, I stood up and I turned to the people that are all beside me and I said to them, well, if none of you are going, then I'm going to get out of my way. And I was frantic. I mean, it was not, I was so scared of missing whatever it was. And I knew there was, there was more than what was just going on. I, I, I had to go. And there was no easy way. I was up in the third stands. I had to go through ramps running down. And I remember at the time, my girlfriend's trying to keep up. And I'm like, I don't have time. I, I can't wait. And she's trying to keep up and she's wearing some heels. And it was just kind of a bit of a comedy act getting down there. But I remember when I got to the to this to the uh, to the astral turf, I guess, to the turf, where there's now a myriad of people, and I'm still, I feel like oh, I got here. I finally got here, and I it did not take away the feeling. The feeling inside me was still this. There's something drawing me. I need. There's got to be something here, and so I, I didn't know what to do. And you're kind of wandering around. Not far, but you're kind of wandering around. You're looking like a, a deer in headlights. You don't know what you're supposed to do. You, you don't come from any sort of church background to know this is an altar call and this is how it's done. To my surprise, someone puts their hand on my shoulder and I kind of look up and he says, Hi there. My name is, and he introduces himself and says, uh, So you've come forward. And I remember my conversation saying, Yeah, I, I don't know what I'm here for. I just got to be here. And then he proceeds to get out a small little book that they have, a little book of John, and leads me through a sinner's prayer. And I didn't understand the sinner's prayer. If I would have heard it before, if someone would have read it to me, I, I couldn't hear it. My ears were deaf. But suddenly there was words, there was life in these words. And I remember saying this prayer, and at the end of saying this prayer, it was like a massive weight was just gone. There was this inrushing of just a massive a sense of, of belonging and comfort and joy and excitement. And it was so many feelings at the same time. It was, it's hard to say, well, it was just this or it was just that. That gentleman that I had then met with, you know, proceeded to give me uh, the small book of John and told me that he would follow up with me and the next day and gave me some instructions that were so instrumental to help me. He said, you know, when you get home, it's important that you pray. You need to start praying. You need to start calling in the name of Jesus. And when he said that, I remember not quite sure what he meant. And then he made me pray for him. He asked me to pray and it was the most oddest thing because I never really had prayed for somebody before. Yet it was the most natural thing to do and I can't say, you know, I had was filled with eloquent speech, but I just said my first simple prayer. And I really felt that, unlike my experience in the bedroom, just telling God how I felt, it felt so different. It felt like I was actually talking to someone that was hearing me. And so it became clear that there is, Jesus was real. God was real and my prayers actually resonated somewhere. I remember when the event was done that night, then wrapping up. So now we're going to go back to the bus and I'm just, I'm so excited. I just can't, I'm like all giddy. I'm excited. I'm jumping up and down. It's the most exciting thing ever. It's, it was more exciting than winning a championship in sports uh, for any of the school or the extra cricket or things that I'd done, any awards. And I remember we got back on the bus and when we got back on the bus to go back to the school, I was so excited. What did I know? I just heard Billy Graham speak, and honestly, I don't really know too much of what he said, but my spirit was alive. And on that bus, I was telling everyone how great Jesus was the whole way back, which was a 45-minute ride, which a lot of them told me to sit down, what do I know, be quiet, but I couldn't stop. 
This joy that had consumed me made me so excited that I just could not stop sharing it and telling people about how great Jesus was. And so that was my transformational moment when I recognized that there's a Savior that loves me. Prior to that, sitting in the stands, I didn't understand what was going on. But I mean, now I know it was God calling me to come forward and he wanted to bring me into the family. So it was so exciting at that particular moment to just be able to respond to the gospel. Hmm. Ken, when you went back home, you know, you, you, you've experienced this in your life. You've heard the gospel. Something is happening inside of you. You have this excitement. What was it like when you went back home, when you actually started to now walk with God? You mentioned that you were dealing, you know, with losing friends and um, seeking love and, you know, acceptance and all of these different things. And so what did that look like for you after experiencing that moment with God? How did Jesus now begin to transform your life from that day? So for me, the transformation, when I came home that night from accepting Jesus, I was so excited to tell my parents. I, knowing that my mom had some sort of recollection or recognition of who Billy Graham was, uh, going home, I wasn't greeted with the response that I expected. And, and it, it made me suddenly fearful. Not that I made the wrong decision, but it's like, I, I can't, I couldn't tell my parents about it because my parents' response was, you know, going forward, why would you do something like that? Why would you do that? That's crazy. And I, I don't know if my parents meant something different, but I interpreted that and got scared. And for me, it meant that my walk and my faith and how I was going to live for Jesus was really a personal, quiet thing. Hmm. I wasn't going to run around from the rooftops and tell everyone like I had just done up until that point of getting home. I remember reading the book of John and the words that the counselor who was faithful to call me every other day for that, that first month uh, just helping me to walk through my faith and to work out salvation about reading the Bible and then praying and saying, God, I don't know what this means. Help me to understand it. And then the next day when I'm turning the page and I'm reading the Bible, suddenly it's just alive and it's like just blown away at, at the fact that I didn't know the answer. And now I'm, the next day I'm reading and praying and now I have the answer. Hmm. I think the big thing for me was that drive and that passion that I recognized there was life in what was going on. The work that had happened that night that I didn't understand when I responded to the gospel message was now drawing me more and more. And there was so much more life in reading the Bible. I would have seen the Bible before, like, like I said, when I was younger, pages with words I didn't even understand. Now I was finding there was life in those words. And as I was praying that I felt that there was a God that was hearing my prayers. And so it just drew me more. As I spent more time praying, I wanted to spend more time reading. As I spent more time reading, I wanted to spend more time praying. And that's those early days as a Christian were just so loving. It was just, I felt like I was just totally in a cocoon, in a bubble, and I just really felt God's embrace. And it wasn't that I felt that I could do no wrong, but God started to, to just gently nudge me and help me to understand some unhealthy things that needed to stop or that I need to stop in my life. It wasn't a rule or something I read in the Bible that was a rule that said, thou shalt not. There was none, none of that. There was not, I went to a church on a Sunday and a pastor said, and you need to stop. It was just God naturally calling me and telling me that my satisfaction will come from him. And I started easily being able to give up things. One of the things I remember very clearly God telling me in my early days as a Christian that I, and I, I can't say what I was addicted to, but God told me that I need to not be addicted to anything. And in that, it's made me mindful in my whole life that if I can't give up something, I have an addiction. And addictions happen naturally and they happen slowly. And I can see the patterns that I had when I wasn't a Christian, how I would be trying to use relationships with girls, non-sexual. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with kissing, but I'm saying they weren't sexual-orientated relationships to try and fill a need in a hole 
where now that wasn't what I was feeling. I didn't feel I needed to have relationships to feel that or fill that that hole or void in my life. I was now finding it by spending time in the Word and spending it with Christ. Mm. And that was very rich for me. Mm. Can You went from a Billy Graham, a Billy Graham event, right? A crusade. You go back home. Could you tell us about the community that came around you? Did did you continue to walk alone after that counselor, right? Stop calling. What did that look like for you as far as community and coming into relationship even with God's people? When I had first gotten saved, I, though this counselor was calling me, for lack of knowing what to do, I was... I thought, well, okay, now I'm supposed to go to church on Sunday. I mean, you found Jesus and you go to church. That's what you do. So I very vividly remember the very first Sunday going to church. And back in the 80s, people wore suits to church. I didn't wear a suit. And then to make matters worse, I was in the second row of the church and I had an itchy head and I was scared to scratch my head because I didn't want people to be looking at me and judging me. But I really felt I needed to be in church. And I remember a friend of mine who was not a Christian at the time talking about this church that he would say the people were just strange. They would raise their hands and they would be dancing in the aisles and uh, they would be uh, all types of craziness going on there. And he said, oh, you got to see it. Well, I did. I did want to see it. I did want to go. So it wasn't too long afterwards. I went the Sunday to this service with, at the time, my girlfriend who I'd gone to Billy Graham with. And when I got there, it was like, I felt the Lord say, I'm home. This is where I need to be. I'm a charismatic person, but I have a very evangelical belief in my faith. So for me, the issue of being biblically grounded and, and solid, I didn't even understand at the time, but God was drawing me to a place where there could be this outward expression of your joy and excitement to be a Christian by raising hands and or dancing in the hallway or the aisleway of the church, and then sitting and hearing some solid biblical teaching. So when I started to attend this church, I started getting connected with people in the church. I started finding there was a whole set of youth that was around my age, and these were people that love Jesus as well. And they read the Bible and there would be Bible studies and prayer meetings to go to. And so started getting plugged in and going to these different events within the church that suddenly were breeding or breathing a community and sense of belonging and a commonality. We love Jesus together. We worship Jesus together. We serve Jesus together. If that was acts of kindness in the community, or if that was acts of service in the church by volunteering to do Sunday school or help set up chairs. I found this sense of community and belonging with people that were like-minded, that wanted lots more Jesus in their life. There was not, well, you're Christian now, this is all there is. There was more, and there was the promise of more. So even from preaching on a Sunday, it was constantly push in more for more of Jesus. And so there was lots of opportunities to serve and to have that community of believers around you. There was lots of what I would call, now I would call Hebrews 11 people. They were heroes in the faith. There were a lot of senior people in the church that had been missionaries, that had done great things, but they were still passionate for Jesus. Mm -hmm. They were still, they were raising their hands and they're dancing in the aisle and they're singing. And it was such an encouragement. It's not like this is a, just a young man's game or, or something you do for 20 years and then you, you retire. This was life. And it was so exciting for me to see that there were older people that were super excited about serving Jesus. And they wanted to talk to me about my walk. They wanted to know where I was at. They would ask me questions and I'd get invited to their house. And they'd ask me, you know, how's my prayer life doing? Or how is, how is my devotional life going? And, and those questions at the time may have seemed a little odd, but that was so much wisdom in those questions. It really helped to draw me. God was using these other individuals to help draw me into the community and help me to be further in love with Jesus and spend more time with him. It was a great relationship. And I, I know that they would be encouraged as well because they would tell me, oh, so encouraging to see your zeal and your passion. And so, you know, I just thought, well, I'm young. That's what I have. But it was such, looking back at it, I see how it was just a, a good relationship both ways. And it really was 
a good way. In some senses, I could say some of these people I would see as, as grandparents that were there in, in my faith to really help me and encourage me. And when I didn't know things to do, there was always people to find that you could pray with. It wasn't about that I had to have the answers. I was abandoned or on an island unto myself. I had a church family. I had a body of people that I could go to. Uh, either I could pray for people or people could come for, pray uh, for me as well. Hmm. Ken, how, remind me, how long have you been faithfully walking with Jesus now? It's been 39 years. 39 years. Now, Ken, in the last 39 years of walking with God, if you could put it in a nutshell, and if you could paint a picture of what that, what life has been walking with Jesus, what, what can you say? I would say the most important things for me as a Christian is the fact that I've had some prayers that I felt God has asked me. My prayer is, God, do anything it takes in my life for me to be more like you. It's not just words. It's a serious prayer. And I prayed that prayer for years, and God has honored it. There may have been job losses or God calling me from one job to another job. And the things that I never expected through that is I lost my first wife. But even in that, God was faithful. may have lost her here on earth, but she's with Jesus in heaven. And so even in that, I can still, my prayer is, God, do whatever it takes to make me more like you. There's no blaming God. God is such a loving God. He cares and gives more than I can ever understand. It's unending love. It's unyielding grace. It is just continual. And God continues to meet me where I am at. And so where my life is, God provided me with a new wife, a new life, But yet my prayer is still, God, sift me. Do what it takes for me to be more like Jesus. And like the Bible says, I can be a stiff and obstinate person. I can think I have the answers, but God, my surrendering to him is what I want. That is where life is, is yielding and surrendering to him. Ken, who is Jesus to you? To me, Jesus is the air I breathe. If all things are to him, through him, from him, back to him, and because of him. I can do all things on my own, but why would I? I want to do all things through Christ. I want to give him glory by what I do. He is everything to me. Ken, for whoever is watching your testimony right now and maybe is struggling in their walk with Jesus and is struggling with being more like Jesus and they feel maybe discouraged, What is a word of encouragement that you can offer to that person who's watching right now? I'd say that God is so loving to us. He is not going to push us into something we can't handle. But we need to be willing to let go and let Him do what He wants to do. His love is perfect. His grace is perfect. And He will meet us in our situations as hard as they are and as hard as it feels like our chest is being ripped out of us. He it will come around us and over us and be with us because that's who He is, a loving God. Yeah, amen. Ken, you mentioned that you uh, lost your first wife. To that person who's watching and, and has had a similar loss and maybe is going through it, What can you say to that person that's watching right now? Losing a loved one in your life is so hard and tragic. It's hard and it's different for every person that experiences. But there is a ripping away and there's a loss and a significant feeling of being alone and part of your identity is gone. But the thing to remember, your identity and who you are in Christ is not gone. Your identity and who Jesus made you to be is not gone. So fall into Jesus and just trust him. That may be many nights of tears and crying, but he will meet you where you are because it's painful and it hurts when you lose someone that you love. Can any last words for people who are watching your testimony right now? I'm not perfect. I've never claimed to be perfect. I never will be perfect. There was only one who was perfect and that was Jesus. I aim to be like him but I know I fail and I fall short continually. But I know I will try again. I will repent of what I've done wrong. I need to own what I have done or what I have said that is not godly. 
and I want to serve my God to give him glory. I want to be able to spread the gospel and preach to those that feel there is nothing in life to live for. For those that would think that this is it, there is nothing more. There is so much more satisfaction in this life. Ken, could you just pray for people who are watching right now on the other side of the screen that are connecting uh, with different parts of uh, your testimony? If you could just pray for them. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are loving and kind and that your favor is towards us. That God, that you sent Jesus because of your love for us. And Lord, I pray for those that feel discouraged and those that feel lost and maybe even wayward and not even sure what to do or where to turn. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to fall on them, that, Lord, they would feel your presence, that, God, that they would spend time in your word and feel drawn to your word, that your word would be life to them, that your Holy Spirit, God, would continue to tenderize their spirit and their soul and draw them. So, Lord, I pray that you would bring people into people's lives that are struggling and hurting. I pray for encouragement. I pray that they would be people that they wouldn't even know. There'd be random acts that come along into their life that present the truth of who Jesus is to them. So God, I just pray that Lord, that whoever hears this message, God, that it would identify with them and they would know that Jesus is Lord and that's a settled issue in their heart and that God, that you would continue to bless them in Jesus' name, amen. Hey everybody, I hope the new testimony has blessed you, has encouraged you. Just wanted to let you know that if you are in need of help, that we have people that are ready to speak with you. So down in the description box below, in the comment section, uh, if you're watching from YouTube, if you're listening from our podcast, just look for the link that says, talk to someone who cares. Click on that, fill out the form, and somebody will get in contact with you locally. Now, this is only available to people in the US right now, but we are working to get resources for our international viewers and listeners. But for right now, if you are in the U.S. and you need help, you need to talk with somebody, please fill out that form and somebody will reach out to you. God bless you, and we'll see you on the next testimony.